Let's go back over 350 years to the early 17th century. George Fox was born in 1624 in Fenny Drayton, a small village in Leicestershire. This panel shows him as a young man surrounded by the influences of his time. His father and mother, Christopher and Mary, stand here in front of the house of his birth with one of his younger sisters. Through the open doorway of the house, we can see a weaver's loom, indicating the family business and showing that George was not born into a poor family. As a young man, he was apprenticed to a shoemaker who was also involved in the wool and cattle trade. The panel also illustrates the visit by George to a beer stall at Atherston Fair in 1643. Here, he was invited to share a jug of beer with his cousin and a friend, both church members, and George was appalled by their determination to drink to excess. Following this incident, at the age of 19, and already spiritually troubled, he left home to travel the country, seeking advice from both priest and dissenter. Of this time, George wrote in his journal, All my hopes in all men were gone so that I had nothing outwardly to help me, nor could tell me what to do. The society of the day that George would meet on his travels was divided by war and religion. We see the cavalier with feathered hat. The plainly dressed non-conformist minister an intimidating roundhead soldier, a demure Puritan woman in white collar and tall bonnet. Answers to his questions would eventually come not from the lips of others, but from within himself. He would come to believe that God spoke directly to each person without the need for priests or churches. During his travels, George Fox was thrown into prison for expressing his beliefs. As this panel shows, in the autumn of 1650, he was held in Derby Jail. At that time, the military authorities were in need of fresh volunteers. After six months in prison, George Fox was offered a captaincy in the army. However, he replied, I live in the virtue of that life and power that takes away the occasion of all wars, According to his journal, the guards then put him into a dungeon. Amongst thirty felons in a lousy, stinking, low place in the ground without any bed. Here we see him in close confinement, his hands and feet secured in stocks. He was finally released in the winter of 1651. In 1652, George Fox remarked in his journal, I spied a great high hill called Pendle Hill, and I went on the top of it with much ado. It was so steep. Seen here dominating the skyline, Pendle Hill remains a steep climb, even to one as accustomed to the outdoor life as was George Fox. The weather must have been fine with plenty of light, because he claimed to have been able to see from the summit the Lancashire Sea, which today we know is Morecambe Bay. A glimpse of this view is captured here on the Furbank Fell panel, the journal continues, And the Lord let me see atop of the hill in what places he had a great people to be gathered. On a good day, it is possible to look across to the Lakeland Mountains. He would certainly have seen a little further to the east, the Yorkshire Dales. And indeed, it was there that his journey was next to take him, through Wensleydale and Garsdale to Sedbur. In early summer, George Fox arrived in Sedbur. It was the time of the annual hiring fair, when the town would be full of people looking for work. On Wednesday the 9th of June, George preached here for several hours to a large crowd outside St Andrew's Church. The panel shows the unusual crenulated design on top of the church walls. He was asked why he hadn't chosen to preach inside the church. So I opened to the people that the ground and house was no holier than another place. On the following Sunday, there was to be a gathering in a little chapel, high up above Sedba on Furbank Fell, where various speakers were to preach. 
Although George Fox attended the gathering, he remained outside. George Fox's journal informs us, In the afternoon, the people gathered about me with several separate teachers, where it was judged there were above a thousand people. Again he preached, this time from a rock nearby, and many were convinced by the following words, Christ was come, who ended the temple and the priests and the tithes. The chapel disappeared long ago. All that can be seen now are three larch trees, one standing stone and a perimeter wall. In front of the rocky outcrop near where George Fox spoke, the distant landscape sweeps round. It's still a powerful place, with the sun overhead and the world at your feet. Two weeks later, George Fox visited the Elizabethan manor house of Swarthmore Hall near Ulverston, shown here today. It was the home of Judge Thomas Fell and his wife Margaret. Margaret was quickly convinced by the teachings of George Fox, and although he never became a Quaker, Judge Fell allowed the early Quakers to hold their meetings here. The Swarthmore panel shows the main room of the house, with a fire roaring in the background. In front, Margaret Fell is surrounded by her daughters, all of whom became Quakers. This room of oak leads, in one corner, to the study of Thomas Fell. You can see him seated there, as was his custom, his study door open, listening into the conversations of the Quaker meetings a few yards away. At Swarthmore, Margaret Fell, together with George Fox, organized the early Quaker movement. Missionaries set out from here to all parts of the country and beyond its shores on dangerous sea voyages, such as that of the Woodhouse, which is shown cutting through the Atlantic waves as it journeyed to the New World. The importance of Judge Fell's position in society helped to protect his wife and her work from persecution. After he died in 1658, however, Margaret and the Quakers at Swarthmore suffered more often in the courts of law. Many were violently set upon by people in the street, and their meetings for worship were frequently broken up. On the panel devoted to Margaret Fell, we see her imprisoned in the grim cells of Lancaster Castle for refusing to swear an oath not to hold meetings at Swarthmore. She was held there for over four years. In 1669, eleven years after the death of her husband, Margaret married George Fox. An impression of the wedding at Bristol is embroidered here by children. One of her letters to him reveals the tenderness of her affections. My soul thirsts to have thee come over, if it be but for two or three days. The peace one finds at Swarthmore today, in the stillness of the rooms behind lattice Tudor windows, recalls the peace the early Quakers must have felt at one time within its walls. In those early days, Quakers would meet for worship wherever they could, even in fields. An oak tree embroidered on the meeting house's panel indicates these early open-air meetings. The buildings were not as important to Quakers as the worship taking place within, and the panel keeping the meeting illustrates how, even though their meeting house was torn down, the Quakers of Horsley Down continued to meet in the rubble. Following the Toleration Act of 1689, meeting houses gradually took a hold on the landscape. Many of those featuring on the panels were constructed simply from local and recycled materials. The meeting house at Brig Flats, the embroidery of which is shown here, was built in 1675, at a time when meeting houses were still illegal. If we go inside today, we will see wooden floors, wooden benches, and a wooden gallery. But when George Fox and Margaret Fell attended a meeting there in 1677, the floor was earth and the roof was stopped up with moss to keep out the cold, rain, and snow. Meeting houses are now an established part of the community, both here and abroad. You will find embroidered within the panels a clapboard meeting house in Norway, 
a whitewashed meeting house in Bolivia, and a meeting house in Ghana without walls, covered by a simple matted roof. At Brigflats, here below home fell, Quakers continue to gather and hold silent worship. George Fox explained this practice using language which reflected the farming communities in which he had lived, worked and travelled. For there is the flock lying down at noonday, and the feeding of the bread of life, and drinking of the springs of life when they do not speak words. The Quaker tapestry is a contemplative experience. Many of the spiritual and social concerns illustrated within the panels are of continuing importance to Quakers today. As you walk round the Quaker tapestry at the Friends Meeting House in Kendall, you will discover further stories from Quaker history. Like the pages of an illuminated manuscript, these panels have the ability to inspire everyone. <laughs>